Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this video, we're going to be discussing hemostasis, which is a very high yield topic for step one. If you guys don't know on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Mad Medicine, you can go to our Hemonk playlist for step one and watch all those videos. And while you're there, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. Now, hemostasis is very important because you're going to be tested on this one way, shape, form, or another. And when it comes to step one, you should definitely know it. In fact, you should know it very well. So I highly recommend you guys spend some time with this content to master it. So with that being said, let's talk about hemostasis. Hemostasis is a process that is designed in our body to prevent blood loss via coagulation. Coagulation is a very broad term that we're using right now because it could involve both blood as well as other aspects in the plasma. Now, usually this happens after damage to a blood vessel. And that damage to a blood vessel is going to lead to a cascade of events that leads to hemostasis. And you can divide hemostasis into primary and secondary hemostasis. So primary hemostasis occurs when the platelets in our bloodstream form a platelet plug. That platelet plug is what we call the primary hemostatic event that's occurring. Now after we have formed a platelet plug, that platelet plug's only job is to stabilize the damaged area in order to prevent additional uh, blood loss. After that, we have secondary hemostasis in which the coagulation cascade takes place. The coagulation cascade occurs in the blood with the blood cells that allows our blood to coagulate and allows for repair of a damaged area to occur. So when it comes to platelets, when it comes to primary hemostasis and when it comes to platelets, there are several things you need to know, both about the structure and the function of platelets. These platelets are created by cells called megakaryocytes in the cytoplasm of the megakaryocytes. And the megakaryocyte cytoplasm and the cell membrane is what, uh, com is what platelets are made up of. So let's say you have a megakaryocyte right here, right? And you have the cytoplasm within it. Let's just give it a nucleus right here, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't really matter. But this is the megakaryocyte. Well, essentially, a platelet is a sort of a bleb of the cytoplasm and the uh, cell membrane that forms the platelets, okay? That's what it is. It's kind of like an exocytosed uh, organism, as you will, even though it's not alive or anything, okay? So that's what a platelet looks like. So the platelet is composed of the megakaryocyte cytoplasm and cellular membrane. This is the smallest element found in the blood. It is anucleated, like I said earlier, it's not alive, and it lasts 8 to 10 days on average. Now, this can be stimulated, platelets can be stimulated to be released by thrombopoietin, TPO. TPO is produced by the liver, and the function of platelets is essentially to form the platelet and fibrin plug during bleeding. And by forming this platelet and fibrin plug, you are able to uh, reduce the amount of damage occurring, you're able to prevent more blood loss, and therefore you have stopped with the bleeding that's occurring. Within the platelets, you have alpha granules and dense granules, both of which contain specific things that are located just within themselves. So in alpha granules, you have VWF, von Willebrand factor, which we're going to talk about later. You have fibrinogen and you have platelet factor 4. And in dense granules, you have ADP, calcium, and serotonin. Very high yield to understand what is in both of these types of granules because you can be quizzed about this for step one. So definitely remember all this stuff right here. And this is a slide of platelets. As you can see, these little tiny pink or blue, not blue, sorry, purplish, bluish uh, dots are what platelets look like under the microscope. Do not get them confused for anything else. This is not an infection. These are just simply platelets roaming around in the bloodstream. So when it comes to primary hemostasis, there are several events that have to occur in order for primary hemostasis to take place. The first event is injury. When there is injury to the blood vessel, you are going to activate the, the primary hemostasis uh, cascade. After injury, you uh, expose certain factors in the blood vessel, in the subendothelial layers, and that exposure leads to adhesion of the platelets. Now, once the platelets have adhesed, that is going to activate platelets, and normally platelets are not activated when they're floating around the bloodstream because if they were, we'd have primary hemostasis happening all the time, and that does not happen. So essentially, after adhesion, you are going to activate your platelets, and that is going to lead to aggregation of more and more platelets to form the platelet fibrin plug. Very, very important to understand what is happening because this is the main cascade that occurs in primary hemostasis. So let's talk about injury. 
Injury usually leads to endothelial damage. This can be anything from a cut or to a ruptured uh, a plaque, that you know, an atherosclerotic plaque. Excuse me. So that leads to injure. Uh, it leads to endothelial damage, and it causes transient vasoconstriction. This is going to be the first sign of defense: the transient vasoconstriction, and it's usually mediated by something called endothelins. Endothelins are released by endothelial cells to aid in vasoconstriction. Okay. Uh, usually they can be released from the neighboring endothelial cells to the area of damage or the area of damage itself because that area has damaged its endothelial cells, releasing more endothelins in order to cause transient vasoconstriction. This can also be uh, mediated by neural stimulation reflex as well. So that is injury. Now when it comes to exposure, after you've injured the area, the, the, the endothelial layer, you are going to have uh, exposure of something called the subendothelial collagen. Now before we talk about that, you have to understand blood vessels are made up of several different layers like the vascular endothelial layer, which is the first layer within the lumen. So if this is your blood vessel right here okay and we're looking at the lumen right here okay this layer right here is going to be your vascular endothelial layer the first layer underneath that you have something called the subendothelial collagen von de von willebrand factor vwf is going to bind to the exposed subendothelial collagen so underneath the subendothelial layer sorry underneath the vascular endothelial layer the subendothelial collagen is only going to show during an injury that injury is going to lead to binding of VWF to the collagen. And uh, VWF is found in two main locations, the Weibel Pilati, Pilati bodies in the endothelial cells and the alpha granules in the platelets. So the, the endothelial cells and the platelets are releasing VWF. Very important because VW, VWF is also going to come back in secondary hemostasis in forming uh, the coagulation cascade. So do not forget VWF. But essentially... It is going to bind to the exposed endo subendothelial collagen. That is what happens in the exposure state. Afterwards, you have the adhesion state. In the adhesion state, platelets are going to bind to the von Willebrand factor via GP1B to uh, VWF. So let's say, let's just draw this out really quickly. This is the endothelial layer right, right here. And then you have the subendothelial collagen right here. The red is the subendothelial collagen. Excuse me. Then you have exposure of the collagen, and you have VWF exposed uh, binding to the subendothelial collagen. You're gonna have a platelet that's gonna come with something called GP1B, glycoprotein one B, and that is gonna bind to the exposed von Willebrand factor. Once it binds, once adhesion occurs to the platelet, it's going to undergo a conformation change and release ADP, thromboxane A2, and calcium. That is what ends up happening. All this is released from the dense granules, okay? From the dense granules, ADP, thromboxane A2, and calcium is going to be released. At the same time, another glycoprotein, GP2B3A receptor, changes to become active. Normally, it is inactive. During adhesion, it's going to become active, and that's going to allow for additional binding of platelets to each other. ADP is also going to help with platelet adhesion with the endothelium. So that's what's happening in adhesion. This is a very important step because once adhesion occurs, that is what activates the uh, um the the platelet in a sense that's what leads to the activation portion of platelet uh, aggregation and primary hemostasis so now let's talk about activation and aggregation adp that was released is going to bind to uh, two receptors p2y1 and p2y12 or p2y12 p2y1 plus adp is going to release calcium and change the pl the platelet shape got the e right there but it's going to change the platelet shape P2Y, uh, P2Y12 plus ADP is going to degranulate the platelet, and it's also going to lead to aggregation. 
all of this, this ADP binding, uh, also is going to cause additional GP2B3A receptors to be expressed at the surface of the platelets. This is all very, very important. This is all very high yield, and I highly recommend you guys spend some time with this portion because it's really important to understand what is happening with platelet activation. If you know what is happening at each step, you are going to understand the issues that can occur uh, with platelet activation and primary homeostasis a lot better. Now, ADP binding is going to be caused uh, is going to cause a decrease in cyclic AMP, and a decrease in cyclic AMP increases platelet activation and aggregation. So you actually want to have decreased cyclic AMP for platelet aggregation and activation. At the same time, fibrinogen and von Willebrand factor are going to bind to uh, GP2B. 3A complexes of a different platelet together, and that's what's going to lead to aggregation via linking platelets. So essentially, it's the GP2B3A complexes that are binding to each other that are activating, uh, that are going to lead to activation of more and more platelets. This is essentially going to lead to the formation of the platelet plug that we've been talking about. Now, one thing to understand, the platelet plug is called uh, the primary hemostasis because it is very unstable. It easily dislodges, and it's only a means of temporary uh, stopping. It's, it's only a means to temporarily stop bleeding. It is not a long-term solution to bleeding. What it does, however, is that it is going to lead to secondary hemostasis, and that is the most important part about this. Primary hemostasis is only there to prevent bleeding from occurring for a long amount of, in, for a short amount of time, enough so that secondary hemostasis can occur. So let's just review all this really quickly so you guys have a good understanding of what is happening. Essentially, number one, you are going to have an injury occur. An injury is going to lead to exposure, right? Exposure of what? That is the subendothelial collagen. When this happens, VWF is going to bind to the subendothelial collagen. That is exposure. Then after exposure, we are going to have adhesion. Okay. In adhesion, a platelet is going to come around and it's going to bind. Uh, let's just write this down. Platelet is going to bind VWF via glycoprotein 1B, GP1B. That is what is essentially happening in uh, uh, adhesion. Now, when it binds, it's going to release ADP, thromboxane A2, and calcium. And finally, GP2B, 3A is going to become active. Now, after adhesion, you have the last two uh, parts, okay? Number four and number five, which is activation plus aggregation. So, just to simplify these uh, situations, ADP plus P2Y1 is going to lead to calcium 2 plus release plus shape change. So that's also going to change the shape. ADP plus P2Y12 is going to lead to degranulation plus aggregation of platelets and then this is going to lead to decreased cyclic AMP which is going to increase steps 4 and 5 and then finally fibrinogen plus one Willebrand factor is going to bind two plus two or more right it, it continues on uh, plate let's together now this is all primary 
hemostasis. Primary hemostasis is then going to allow for secondary hemostasis to occur. And that is the coagulation cascade, which we're going to talk about later. Essentially, that is everything you need to know for primary uh, hemostasis and hemostasis in general right now. We're going to go on. We're going to talk more about the disorders associated with primary hemostasis in the upcoming uh, lectures. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this helped. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. If you guys want us to cover a certain topic or if you guys have any questions, comment on the videos below and we'll answer them. You can follow us on social media right here. And you can find all these lectures on your favorite podcast service for free. Just search Mad Medicine and we'll pop up.